six to eight seconds. Is this delayed. the table then the thing that's at the crosswalk? The it's crosswalk a, is on uh, top. It has a ten foot flat section in the middle of the two six foot ramps, whereas a speed hump in Portland is a seven feet up, seven feet down. So 14 foot table. and 22 foot devices. There's a lot of Scott's got tons that's of this information. Um, yeah, we have all this. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I did yeah. it. No, oh, no problem. No problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Do you guys have a lot of speed bumps yet? No. Um, no. no. We probably match speed pumps as you have circles. I mean, we have over 1,200 speed pumps in Portland and growing rapidly with our neighborhood. Our neighborhood, our neighborhood greenways have the 20 mile per hour standard for 85th percentile that we're trying to achieve. We try to achieve an operational speed of 20 miles per hour at 85th percentile. As in the past, we were trying to get within five of the posted, 25 usually. So we've gone from a 400 to 500 foot spacing down to a 300 to 400 foot spacing, depending on what the 85th percentile is before. So we're increasing the number of bumps along the tree by about 40%. So we're going to be building a lot more bumps in the future. Cool. The one on the bottom is uh, offset speed table. Scott, we, the public doesn't mind that, it sounds like. Um, I've, had, I've not had as much pushback from the public as I had, had internally. Hmm. But, hmm. Um, well, people like cars to slow down on the street. And then, so, yeah, what's the internal pushback? Yes. A lot of bumps. The, yeah, the internal pushback is like we're not we're we're not we don't have enough money to maintain our streets. How can you do anything that is adding to our long term costs or anything that's not maintenance? Mm -hmm. That's been the pushback. And our and to be honest with you, the, the salute the part of how we've won on that is we just recently in our budget cutting exercises went through this sort of streets of citywide significance. That's our way of triaging resources that we have left. So it's our busiest streets. Streets carry the most freight and buses and that sort of thing. And it's this network of neighborhood greenways. Mm -hmm. And it's different. We're gonna main, you don't need to maintain those streets that are mostly cars and very low volumes the same way that you're maintaining your busiest streets. So that's sort of, I think, helping in the sense that we can say, you don't have to maintain every street at that same level. You're gonna maintain the busiest streets and the streets that make up this network. That's how we're gonna triage resources. And so far, I think that seems to be uh, working pretty well. Which is also one of the arguments I have with it internally is that, um, and you may have seen some of my emails, we can't afford to maintain what we have. And so expecting us to build to that same standard in the future, I cannot wrap my head around. So that's why part of our street by street and local and our low impact street is, is gaining traction. It's because people are realizing that we can't build it and maintain what we have, so we can't keep building that same way in the future. I, I like the, that approach where you are designating these uh, streets as uh, a comp street. Uh, mm -hmm. And that way you can, uh, uh, kind of direct your limited resources to the streets that uh, you want exactly. to have. Yeah, so right. it, now you can maintain it and have a higher quality and then get more usage so right. you can now include the crossing. And, and, as, kind of a, and as Greg will say, I'll transition over to him, but that's part of the that's part of one of the marketing tools as you're in the neighborhood. This street's going to get better maintenance than other streets. And, you know, the other thing about, you know, the internal pushback is, you know, for us to traffic on a street to 20 miles an hour versus to 25 miles an hour, we're looking at a marginal difference is about $10,000 a mile. Mm. You know, okay. um, I mean, right. you know, we're having these discussions with folks that build, you know, quarter to million, quarter to million to million dollar traffic signals that we're spending, you know, this $10,000 or something, and it's like, guys, the mar you know, we're. What are we quibbling about here? Right. You know, hundred forty thousand dollar project a mile goes to like one hundred fifty thousand dollars a mile. You know, two blocks of sidewalk. We just got a cost estimate a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have drainage. Two blocks. two blocks. They're longer blocks, but there's no drainage and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So you can start to see. I mean, that would be what you know, seven so, miles, six miles. So, so and and you know, you build. You want to build your streets to how you want them to perform. You know, not to how you hope they're going to perform. Um, and so, um, you know, that's. What everything about traffic safety that I've seen shows. I mean, there's been some research about England's 20 mile an hour zones and places where they just put up signs, you know, they saw about a one mile an hour difference and not much difference in terms of crash performance. Places where they actually traffic calm to 20 miles an hour, they saw a 10 mile an hour difference and, you know, 40 to 60 percent reductions in injury crashes. And so, um, you know, that, uh, you know, building what you want, the community you want to live in. You know, is deliberate, and um, you know there are some times where you have to make hard choices, and there are some times where you just shouldn't cut corners. And one of those has to do with you know if we have the ability to bring it to twenty, we should. Um, and so, um, let me start by answering the how do you pick your network thing. 
Um, but but I want to get to um, uh, uh, quickly um, how we really build the network, which is the public process. And, um, uh, so what we're looking for are streets that um, connect schools, parks, provide access to business and transit. So that can be, you know, we're a block away or a couple blocks away from that business district, and maybe there's a bike corral a couple blocks away that we're going to encourage people to use. You're riding right the neighbor Greenway, you get there. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and so we're looking for streets, you know, um, that have low volume and low speed um, to start, um, that provide these community connections. Um, so in the past, you know, one of our m more well-known projects was uh, in Southeast Ports called Lincoln Harrison, Lincoln Street and Harrison Street. Um, they were part of the neighborhood traffic calming program, and before they were traffic calmed, Harrison Street between 20th Avenue and Cesar Chavez or 39th Avenue uh, was carrying about 5,000 cars a day. Um, after it was traffic calmed, it went to 2,000 cars a day. So they moved 3,000 cars. And they also reduced the 85th by uh, 11 miles an hour. And the staff that worked on that came back and said, I'm never doing that again. Um, it was a total, you know, everyone's freaking out. Oh my gosh, you're moving 3,000 cars. We knew that they would be on the adjacent busy streets because of the way that the connectivity worked um, uh, and that it would work and those 3,000 cars didn't circulate through the neighborhood. They went to collector streets where they were more appropriate to be anyway, but the political ramifications were such that it just weren't going to do that. Um, and it took a long time before we started to say, we can build things that block car access but let pedestrians and bikes through. Um, and one of the things that really cracked that nut was to say, well, Instead of starting on a street that has 5,000 cars a day, let's start on a street that has 300 cars a day, or 500 cars a day, or 800 cars a day, or whatever it is, you know, under 1,000. Um, and let's take that street and make it work really well for walking and biking. Uh, we'll make it slow. We'll make it so that on your bike you only have to stop at the busy street. We'll make it so that um, we're going to maintain this low volume of cars. Well, it's a, it's a sort of balancing act because what that means is that we have to turn the stop sign right so that you're only stopping at the busy street and we're going to provide stop control on those side streets so that the greenway becomes the you know the arterial for walking and biking through the neighborhood um, but at the same time we're going to create some barriers occasionally that make it in a very managed way um, uh, 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 you know so that we don't increase that volume of cars so we're going to turn the stop signs it's going to reduce friction and say oh gosh this is a better place to drive my car now and I don't have to stop right um, and then to increase a little friction, we're going to put in speed bumps, right? So, you, oh, well, I have to go 20, and I have to ride over speed bumps. Well, maybe it's better to be on that busy street. And occasionally, we're going to say, you know, we need even more friction, so we're going to do something that's going to block car traffic, lead, pet, and bike traffic through. Um, and so uh, it's a very strategic approach um, to identifying the network. Um, we do base it on the Portland Bicycle Plan for 2030. The Portland Bicycle Plan for 2030's map was based on our work in terms of neighborhood greenways, so there's a nice sort of link there. Um, but there are times where you go to implementation and you say, gosh, um, that street that's in the plan just doesn't work as well. So we're going to propose this other street and, and kind of talk through why. Um, the other thing that we look for is, you know, at the busy streets. If we have two adjacent streets that perform relatively similar in terms of volume and speed and what they connect. But, you know, along the way they got to cross streets and sometimes you're crossing a street where it's offset or where, um, you know, it's not a standard four leg intersection or it's a five leg intersection. And sometimes you're, you know, the other one you're on a four leg straight on, flat, you know, good visibility. You know, it's easier for us to create a safe crossing in that condition. So volume, speed, connection all being equal well, which one is more feasible to create safe crossings? So, you know, we're looking at all that kind of uh, stuff um, as we're saying, well, what, how do we want to build a network that connects our community? And, um, uh, and then, um, you know, and you guys are really great about kind of getting the, the neighborhood greenway concept in terms of a communication tool, thinking about what that means for it being a product, you know, you have to get on your bike to benefit, you can walk, you can live on the street, you can jog, you can skateboard, you can ride your bike, whatever it is, this thing's good for you. Um, you know, you can be a bird in my neighborhood and you're going to like this thing because we're going to plant some trees. Um, you know, um, <laughs> you know? Um, and so 
Um, uh, and so, you know, that concept about it, I think, is really uh, uh, resonating. But, and the other thing about that concept is, you know, when, you know, a dork like me gets in front of a neighborhood and says, you know, I want to build something, if I say, I want to build Bike Boulevard, then some people in the room say, those guys are scofflaws, they don't pay for anything, I don't ride a bike, this isn't for me. When I get in front of a room and I say, I'm going to build a neighbor Greenway, and here's all those elements, and it's not just about the bike, it's about everybody, um, you know, it helps in delivering that product. You guys are getting that. Um, what I really want to focus on is some other stuff um, that, you know, I'm hopeful might help. Um, uh, because um, uh, in my mind, our work and what makes it important is what has happened in 10 years from today because of what we've done and, and what we've actually built. And so there's always these balancing acts about communication or about process or about how to deal with dissent um, that uh, are influence that of our, our effectiveness at actually implementing something that the person that's not the activist and may not even be shown up to the meetings, but we're going to make their life better, right, because of our work. Um, at the end of that road, you know, how do we get there? Um, so let me start off. Um, I'm going to... Printed uh, for you. Um, this is an actual announcement that we sent. So, what we do when we're going to uh, build a neighborhood greenway um, is, uh, like for example, this black line here was one project. This is over five miles of project. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is we take that neighborhood greenway route and we go to the next collector street off of it in either direction. So we're you know this big swath in here, right? Um, so this one, we sent out over 7,000 letters mm. that look like this, right? Um, and we sent to every address, every apartment, every business, every, every address in that area. We sent one of these. It has a letter on the front and has a map on the back, black and white. And, um, and you know, what this does do is it says, hey, good news, we're going to do some stuff to make your neighborhood safer, more livable. We're going to have these open houses. Here's where they're going to be and when they're going to be. Here's our general goals, right? Here's, here's our concept that we're going to discuss in terms of what this route looks like, right? But you might know when you look at this what we don't do. We don't say, hey, we're going to build refuge islands here and a signal there, and uh, we're going to turn all this stop sign and that stop sign and that stop sign. We're going to build in a traffic barrier here and there and there. Um, it, it doesn't get into that level of detail when we're announcing our public open houses. So let me, let me pass this around. I hope I have enough for everybody here. Um, uh, and so, um, well, well, why not? And I, and, I, and, I, um, and I bring that up, I did see you know, that, you know, I, I think you guys maybe took a different approach where you said, you know, this is what we're proposing. And, and I think, um, I think it, it's, a, it's a two edge problem. One is, um, a lot of times when you have something new and you're going into a neighborhood and you're saying, hey, I want to do something. Um, some people that um, uh, uh, might be resistant to change. And their first thing they'll say is, you've made up your mind. It doesn't matter why that for me to be here because you know what you're going to do. You're going to do it anyway. You're not going to listen to me. And when I send them a letter that starts out with, hey, look what I want to build, that cements that perspective. The second thing is, um, uh, you know, when you send out that letter, the number of hornet's nests you kick over is you not humongous. Right, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and so, um, how do you manage what that expectation is in a way that is clear and concise about what you want to do, in a way that lets you deliver to make this neighborhood safety improve um, and livability improve? So, um, so you'll see that's this is if you were living in Portland, you were going to um, come to one of our open houses. This is what you'd get in the mail. Right, please come. Um, and then when he'd show up, and unfortunately I, I had hoped to find the presentation for this project, um, and I didn't, but 
our intro to our presentation or to our project presentations are always the same. Um, they have this picture, and in this case, it would say North Portland Connector Neighborhood Greenway. And our first slide is, hey, we care about traffic safety. We take a comprehensive approach to traffic safety. And um, if I, we delivered this in Seattle. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's a bigger picture than this, and neighborhood greenways is an important part of our overall traffic safety effort, right? And then we say, hey, it's good things are happening. All right, here's some good news about our city that you might not have known about, that our traffic fatals are going down faster than the rest of the country, um, and, you know, the areas of town that have had these types of services where we traffic calm, provide good crossing treatments, and so on, are benefiting more from those safety benefits. Um, and we want to bring those benefits to your neighborhood. And it's not just that one particular mode of travel is benefiting, everybody's benefiting, whether you're riding a bike, you're walking, you're driving, you know, these safety improvements and, um, uh, you know, um, when we make safety improvements for most vulnerable, you know, it benefits the safety of everybody. So, um, you know, so we kind of talk about that, like, hey, this isn't us and them and driver, team driver and team bicycle rider and team pedestrian all fighting with each other. You know, we want to do things that make everybody safe. And then we talk about neighbor agreements. And, um, can I interrupt you, Greg, just yeah. one second so you can take a breath, too? No. The, uh, okay. Yeah, it's always dangerous. <laughs> There's a CDC document out. We haven't actually taken that much advantage of this, but we never did one before to you guys. Um, it talks about how do you talk, you know, how do, the, how, as um, healthcare professionals, and to read this is like healthcare, how do you talk about this sort of thing? And what they recommend is that early in your meetings, like you're asking, how many of you work in a field where part of your job is to make sure that people can, you know, have a more healthy and productive life than they might have now? Right? And if you think about it, whether you're working in the medical business or, you know, there's just so many different, you know, recreation or whatever. I mean, you're going to have a lot of people raise their hand and say that they do that. And say, you know, I'm in that business too. Um, there's an emerging new idea, some coming from Europe, some coming from other cities, about how we better just deal with that. How do we better make sure that the systems that we create make it so that people can have healthy and productive lives? Lots, I mean, that's a huge part of what everybody's working on. That's what this is about. And so it's a way of making it a little less foreign and have people kind of identify with it and want to offer up ideas around that as well. I think it's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. We haven't incorporated it as much as maybe we could. That's my little break for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. It gave me a chance to see what the news story from the <laughs> lawyer's meeting is looking like. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, uh, so this slide in particular, I want to spend a little time with this group about. Um, so the first way we introduce it to the neighborhood as we say, there are no silver bullets. We need we need a comprehensive approach. Um, our what we're looking at is we need to get people from point A to point B, walking and biking. That it takes a mix of facility types, and that we're looking for um, a, not a complete street, but a complete transportation system. You know, when we drive our cars, a lot of us live on residential streets. I mean, seventy percent of streets in America are residential. And we drive a car on that residential street, and then we turn on to like a little bit higher over street, maybe a neighborhood collector, and then a district collector, and then a, you know, maybe a highway eventually to kind of work our way back down. And and those different street environments are serving that trip. Um, and so, in the same way with walking and biking, particularly with biking, and given where we are in our current transportation mode system, um, we need we need a system that responds in that way. And so, when we think about developing our um, our uh, bike network. We think about it like almost like a transit network. So the neighborhood greenways are like our bus system. They are our basic level of service that serves the whole community. We're able to implement them relatively quickly. They're low cost, they're low political um, capital because people want less traffic on their street, they want slower traffic, they want good crossings, those kind of things. Um, uh, uh, so it's our backbone of our network in a lot of ways. Um, and then, that was a good, good poser, wasn't it, Don? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, then you think about our buffer bike lanes, our cycle tracks, our paths. That's kind of like our streetcar, you know, light rail, or aerial tram, you know, they're, they're making important links in our system. Um, uh, there are times where you just have a lot of users where you need it there, you know. Our destinations are our busy street. And so, the neighbor Greenway concept reduces conflict on busy street because it's a much more pleasant place. People will choose to be there. Um, 
but we still need that busy street network. It's a it's it's sort of like networks within the network. So you have you know you have your neighborhood network, you have your busy street network, and they all link together. I mean, when we ride tomorrow, we'll actually probably see some of that where you know you're on a neighbor greenway, and then we're going to be on a bike lane that's going to bring us by a park, and then we'll be on another neighbor greenway, and, you know that kind of thing. And um, uh, and I just wanted to to make sure because um, you know it's a uh, 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 sitting where I sit, you know, and, and my work with folks in Seattle, you know, it's like it's really, I mean, it's been an amazing experience for me. Um, uh, in a lot of ways, you know, I'm just, in a lot of ways, I'm jealous. Like, you know, the amount of community organizing that's happening, the, the you know, the, the depth and breadth of it throughout the city, the, you know, there's all sorts of things that are just mind blowingly wonderful, you know. So, um, uh, so from that perspective, I'm always like, you know, I'm, and, that, and that's the majority of my perspective. Um, but I do hear a little bit of, you know, well, this group wants, you know, to focus here and that group wants to focus there and, you know, and, you know, some quotes maybe about, you know, like, we're going to get the bikes off the busy street or, you know, things like that, that, um, you know, uh, from my perspective, it's like, you know, just as an outsider looking in, you know, um, uh, an area where it's like, how do we, how do you guys really, you know, work that out? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, in a way, because you know, what we don't want is like a circular firing squad among advocates. Um, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and um, and so um, uh, you know, that's one thing I want to just basically, you know, be brave, right, and say, hey, you know, if there's some healing to do in what I'm watching, it's that. Um, you know, and um, and I would say, um, you know, we wouldn't say. This is going to get the bikes off the busy street. What we would say is, it's going to reduce conflict on the busy street. It's going to provide an alternative where you're going to see less traffic on the busy street. But the bikes need to be on the busy street. Um, that's where the destinations are. That's sometimes really critical links in the system. And so, you know, what it comes down to is really thinking about the strategy, how to deliver that complete transportation system. Um, and so, uh, uh, I hope that's enough time on that slide. Okay. Well, as you change that, Greg, I mean, the, uh, the, the critique, and it drives you bananas when you're in meetings, is somebody will get up and be like, I ride my bike all the time, and I'd never ride on this neighborhood greenway, I ride on this busy street, and you need to be building a cycle track on that busy street. And I think part of the, our response to that is, you know, again, back to that, cycle tracks are really expensive, they're really important places that you can do it, but the return on investment is based on how many people use it. Well, if you've already, I mean, Portland, we're getting to that sweet spot where we have enough people riding now on our systems of neighborhood greenways that lots of those kinds of more expensive uh, bike facilities on the busier streets are starting to pencil out, and there's enough political support for it. But you, you know, if that's if you're stra I haven't seen anybody in the United States. I think it'd be very difficult to start with that, right? Mm -hmm. Let's start with the most expensive thing. Let's start with the hardest part first. So I think that's you know that message has resonated well. I think even with the people that are really wanting the cycle track, is we're going to do some of that, and we're going to start doing more as we get more ridership. But we need the neighborhood greenway network to get there. Okay. Um, yes. Oh, I just want to say thank you for that bit of yeah. feedback that because because well that is actually one of our key pain points right now sure. is how do we brand our message? How do we deliver it in a consistent way across 19 different groups to where all these different people from all these different backgrounds who are new to advocacy, a lot of us, um, are delivering these presentations about neighborhood greenways with no training. Okay. And over how lunch we were just talking about a couple of those exact people that you just described. <laughs> <laughs> the naysayers. Behind their backs. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure I'm guilty of all these sins at one point or another in my well, growth too. process. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, we really do need to learn from other people in terms of how to message this, how to, how to drive a process, how to or, and how to spread it to more than just the two block segment of my neighborhood. Who really, really wants it, but nobody else heard of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm telling you how we do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> how much of the budget is spent on like outreach and getting buy-in from the community? Not a lot. No. Um, I mean, we send out this letter. Um, you know, maybe that's 500 bucks or something. We have two public open houses that are two hours each. Um, we reserve time in the school, and usually have to pay for that. Um, a lot of times we'll, in addition, wind up getting invited to like a neighborhood association meeting or like a community meeting, it's just sort of staff time. Mm -hmm. But um, but that's about it. You know, it's uh, 
We do right now are working, um, uh, and Scott's really expensive. <laughs> um, uh, but that's not really outreach. I mean, Scott's, you know, the engineering side um, in terms of the outreach. We're, we're also right now in the process of having a discussion about marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, okay, now we're starting to get a network. Can we use kind of our smart trips approach? Are there things we can do to the street itself that can be marketing? Um, you know, how are we using other existing community events as marketing resources? You know, are we having contests? Are we having, you know, so um, I think in terms of initial public outreach, you know, we've been delivering 15 miles at least a year. Um, you know, in 2009, we had 29% of residents within a half mile of a network. Today, we have over 65%. Um, and so, you know, we feel like we're in a pretty sweet spot in terms of being able to deliver an effective system and we're able to do it in a fairly streamlined, low cost way so we can focus our, you know, limited dollars on actually doing things um, that, you know, like I say, when I say that, I mean the things that in 10 years are going to affect someone's life. Of the 15 miles that we built per year, how many of those open houses do you think you were at the open house or I was at the open house? Every one. So this, again, I think that, that question of how you sort of manage it with the volunteerism as well as, um, you know, we used to have this process at Peabody where we had cradle to grave project managers. Yeah. And so there are different, especially with these kinds of projects, you tend to get project managers that are newer and um, maybe have been transferred up from other places. Because, you know, if you have the choice of just you get a tram project or you get a neighbor greenway project, you know, the risk, obviously, of a really expensive project. But the upshot is, that wasn't, for us at least, our experience was we need people that are doing this out of a lot and have gotten good at having these neighborhood conversations and our project managers like it too so Greg and I basically do these these projects we've gotten pretty good at it over time and then the second meeting will have Scott at it and it will have the project manager that's going to deliver the project and so we basically you know get the conversation going figure out if it's you know if you know there are projects where you as you get out there they're just not ready to go um, Greg can talk more about that probably as we roll along. But either way, that's been, at least for us, just so you know, a couple people that do this work a lot and have been reasonably successful at it, at the starting point of every conversation, being able to get up there and tell the stories. And when people say, you know, get up like Greg was just saying and say, you're not going to listen to me, I know what's happening. We say, you can say that, but let me give you these examples of how things have changed on other projects we've done. You know, if you want to take the attitude again in the room that we're just going to do what we want to do, that's, you know, you have that choice, but that hasn't the way, been the way it's worked on other projects. So I think that piece, just to not, you know, not that Greg and I are God's gift to like, you know, building greenways or something like that, but having <laughs> some people. I with from Mark <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having some people that consistently are doing that piece of it is a pretty, I think is pretty important. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other strategy, you know, on that, that I, you know, sometimes we might go there, sometimes I just say, you know, I hear what you're, where you're coming from. I've felt that way myself, um, uh, and I hope by the end of this conversation, you don't feel that way anymore. Yeah, give us a chance um, to, to walk through this project, and and, um, and hopefully, hopefully, we, we get to a better place than that. Um, uh, so the next thing we do is just kind of say why neighbor greenways, right? Um, well, we have five kinds of roads in Portland. I think you guys have seen this. You know, freeways and other you know um, types of roads. And then this is our inventory of residential streets. So it's like massive. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a little about, you know, is a low crash environment in general and those types of things. And then our goals. Um, and this is an old presentation. Um, uh, so under 1,000 cars um, a day. Uh, keep the through traffic on the through streets. So residential streets are local streets. For motor vehicles, we want local trips, not through trips. Um, uh, for beds and bikes, we want through trips. Um, protect residential character of our neighborhoods. Um, improve safety. Uh, now, this would say speeds at or under 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, we passed a law last uh, legislative session in, in collaboration with Oregon Trucking Association, AAA. Have you guys heard about this? Yeah, we've probably mentioned it. It was um, covered by Denver. Yep. Okay, yeah. cool. So less than 2,000 cars a day, under 30 mile an hour, 85th. Have a map adopted by city council, and then 20 mile an hour. So we're the 22nd of this month, we'll be in front of City Council with our ordinance. The 24th, we'll have our press event. Uh, and then really this rainy season, when sign work happens in earnest, we'll be installing something like 35 miles of 20 mile an hour streets. Mm -hmm. um, maybe wow. more than that, actually. And if you want to go deeper on that, I did a presentation to the... Um, I sent them that. Oh, you did? Sweet. Yeah, actually, I think it is more than that. I, am, if, I, I need to find out the number of miles mile um, before we go to the press, but it's, it's a lot of miles. Um, uh, that will be 20. Um, uh, 
and uh, help people across busy streets, um, and then efficiently get people where they want to go. I mean, that's sort of the goals. Um, and then we say, you know, this stuff works. You know, we're not doing it. We're doing it because there's it's a proven concept. 20 mile an hour streets with residential traffic calming and good crossing treatments. You know, in England, there's a study that, um, you know, 42% decrease in all crash activity, 46% uh, uh, decrease in serious death injuries, biggest reduction for pets were kids. But again, the biggest reduction overall are people in motor vehicles. So this concept that pedestrian and safety, pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements, the biggest improvements are for people in cars and trucks. Um, and then we walk through the map. So, you know, I'd have that map that you have there on a board, and I'd kind of say, hey, you know, here's what we've already developed in terms of other neighborhood greenways. Here's some parks and some schools and stuff in your neighborhood that this is going to connect. And just kind of walk through, like, hey, what is this, why, what is this network going to serve? Um, and that's uh, one other thing just to, um, to share. Um, and, you know, I don't live in Seattle. I'm not involved in your work. So, you know, I catch bits and pieces from different directions. And, and one, one thing that, you know, um, that struck me um, is a, a couple times I've heard, well, the neighborhood greenways in Seattle aren't yet um, put together in such a way where they are a network that are connected. And, um, and I think that's really important to focus on. That, that, the, um, that we found that the network itself, that neighborhood greenway network itself, should be connected. Um, so that, you know, if I'm serving that family with an eight-year-old or a six-year-old, that they have that consistent experience along their trip. And so really thinking about that connectivity is really important. And this map, you know, and the way we walk through it, it also helps in the public process because it's like, hey, you know, here's how this thing is going to add value, you know. And a big part of that is the fact that it's a network. Um, uh, uh, oh, this is from the second one. So in the first open house, the, the next thing we do is we share data. Um, uh, and so we've all, each one of these boxes is the speed and volume count that we've taken um, relative to the network. And we kind of walk through and say, here's what we're seeing for speed and volume, the streets that we're crossing, what those look like. You know, are we missing anything? Are there other places we need to collect data? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and just kind of slowly walk through that. Um, uh, and then we start to get into improvements um, that are potential improvements. Um, and uh, in this case, I went a little out of order because of the nature of this project. This project right here actually, um, uh, uh, Paolo uh, Nunes Bueno was, was at this open house. Um, uh, this open house was like, you know, over 90 people, standing room only. Um, and they, he said they basically gave you a standing ovation at the end. We, it, you know, it started out with some concern and tension from the neighborhood, and towards the end of the meeting, um, a man stood up and said, you know, I came here to kick your guys' butt. Um, you know, we, we just wanted to stop you, and I just have to say thanks. You know, this is a really important thing for our neighborhood. It's going to be really nice. And I think, you know, as people start to realize, like, hey, we're not talking about stripping out parking and painting bike lanes on residential streets and, you know, we're not, you know, it's, it's really something that's about, you know, really developing a neighborhood. Um, people start to get it and, you know, um, and it, it starts to move that middle, you know. Um, you'll have the people walking in that love you because they want to walk and bike and that's what they're focused on, that hate you because they just don't like change or whatever it is. And then there's sort of the, the middle that's like, you know, what's going on here? Um, you know, help me understand, and, and usually those folks start to say, oh, you mean I can, like, go for a walk with my dog in a more pleasant street? Sweet, this sounds pretty good. Um, and so, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so then we start to say, um, hey, you know, here are some ideas we have, you know. Um, and so, uh, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to put in speed bumps to manage this 20 and, you know, and stuff like that. We're going to put in, stop, you know, return stop signs. Usually I'm not so flipping about it, and, you know. A little bit go a little more slowly, um, uh, and a lot of times on this slide in particular is where you start to get conversation about the route, right? Hey, you know, um, for example, on this one, uh, 63rd Avenue here, the conversation turned into one about 60th Avenue. Hey, there's a bus stop up there at Vermont and 60th. A lot of us use, and um, you know, 60th actually connects down here, you know, through the neighborhood and um, stuff like that. So. 
you know, through that conversation, the next, this was the first open house map. Second open house, this wasn't 63rd Avenue anymore, 60th. Right. Interrupt him just another second, Greg. Is the other thing we do as far as one of the just sort of gimmicky things that I think works is we'll have all these boards that are showing on the PowerPoint on uh, RT uh, in the East. And so one of us is giving the presentation and one of us is taking notes. And if we get, especially if you get somebody who's kind of argumentative and they're like, you don't get it, this is the issue. Like, hey, I got the pen, come up here, draw it on here. And you know, it, but you know, like all you guys know, I mean, people seeing what they're saying being written down, people that are upset being able to come up and make sure that they get to write down what they're trying to say it has enormous value as far as just that getting people involved. Plus, the other thing we do at the very beginning of the meeting is say, this first meeting, one of the main thing we want you guys to do is nobody should sit on their hands. This is the meeting where we want to get as much information. If you're kind of concerned about something, but you're afraid that maybe it's not really an issue, and you like the project, but you don't want to say anything negative. Don't sit on your hands. Everybody, we want to hear you know everything out at this first meeting. Those kinds of those kinds of uh, tools have been really useful. And to be honest, when when Greg and I get get tired or lazy or want to spend more time with our family, and we only send one person to the meeting, it sometimes can work. But really, I would recommend that you need that a person that can be taking notes. That people see they're taking notes, not in the back, you know, taking notes on their own sheet. But doing it right up in front just makes a big difference. Um, from our experience and having two people. I think is really necessary. It's one of the way you make them believe that they're listening to this. <laughs> um, that was a joke, because I was thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We are listening. Um, and actually, I just uh, gave um, a couple of stacks of maps to pass around, um, just as another example. Um, uh, as a, uh, um, another little example, this first letter I gave you, this was the map that went out. And when we were in the open house, well, there's some fireworks um, that, you know, Winchell Street's not the right street and, um, you, know, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, there's Columbia Park, it's really, it's a narrow street and there's all this congestion and, gosh, Terry Street west of Wabash is super duper duper narrow and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, sometimes when we're having these conversations, in our, the way that Mark and I talk about it is we need to isolate the controversy. So sometimes people are putting up big barriers to the whole project when they're really just concerned about one thing. And if you can solve all these other problems and just kind of parking lot that one thing and then figure it out, it can really help you along. And this was a really good example of that, where the first meeting, I mean, we just spent a lot of time, you know, about, you know, the southern end of really Winchell and Terry and, and that kind of stuff. So the second map I just passed you is what we actually built. And you can see it moved to Kilpatrick, and then it went over to Emerald. So we, this little portion right here of the map is different based on that open house. So we just changed this little piece right here from the network to this. And you know, we had the neighborhood president there. She was the one that recommended this was the solution based on the community conversation. And we got our network built. This was the one where we actually wind up going around two sides of a school right here. Um, uh, that otherwise was kind of, you know, we were a little bit away from it. Um, uh, and um, by changing this little section right here, we broke the log, log jam and everything else on the project came easier. Um, because, uh, you know, we're hearing from the folks that, you know, one of the people in particular, she was up and, you know, she was practically crying, you know. And, um, and you know, she's like, you guys actually heard us and are reacting. and. And it builds that community support from people that might otherwise try to fight you um, by actually isolating that issue and, and working on it. Plus, well, um, by writing all the stuff down on the maps while you're doing that, mm -hmm. it just makes it really easy. You know, we'll have a follow-up meeting with the project manager who's going to be the second meeting with Scott. And we're basically in a you know, little tiny office with those maps. Scott, just in two weeks, you have to change the map and redesign yeah. everything. <laughs> 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 it's, just, okay. it's just so much easier when you're busy and doing 100 things to come back with the maps with the actual drawings on them, um, you know, the notes and everything. Scott's worked with us uh, enough now that oftentimes Scott's he says, I already did that. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I don't yes. want to interrupt mid-presentation, no, but at your time, given what's going on right now, it would be really valuable to know, like, when do you change a project versus just say that's the one neighbor and we're just going to ignore them? Yeah, um, it's, there's no rules. Um, you know, uh, and sometimes it has to, sometimes it's like, well, gosh, this person, you know, 
like at one point in an open house this year, I'm, ans I'm answering so many questions for this one person that eventually one of the answers is, the speed bumps are not gonna change the amount of water that falls on your street. <laughs> because now it's getting to, the speed bumps are gonna cause floods in my yard, right? Um, and, uh, and it's like, well, you know, we're kind of walking, so it's like, you know, or I'm sorry, I can't tell everybody to wake up 10 minutes earlier so that they're not so in a rush when they get to school. Like, I, I can't control when they have breakfast, you know? Um, uh, so, so there becomes this, um, Scott can control when they have breakfast. Uh, uh, but it, it, <laughs> We've it, changed it, projects even after we've gone through the entire approval process yeah. and had a neighborhood association tell us, this is what we want you to build. And we get out there to build it and the business owner says, if you build that, I'm going to protest. And so instead of a diverter island, we just put in a couple ped refuges. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are absolutely flexible because we want the greenway first and the best greenway second. The other thing I'd add is the second meeting we come back with, um, here's what we heard as far as the objectives of this project. And here's how we would measure that as far as success. So you might end up at a spot where people are like, well, yeah, we want to get from here to here, but we don't like any of these options. We'll say, okay, well, we'll come back. What we heard is that there's not consensus on this issue yet. Is there consensus around this concept? You want to be able to get from here to here. Okay, when we come back for the next meeting, we're going to bring you a couple options. And then what we start to do is we start to, ask, we start to say, here's what we're struggling with. Help us out. What we're struggling with is that's too high of a volume street or it's too far out of direction. Help us understand why would people use this, right? And just kind of turning the question back to the group, I think that's worked reasonably well. Mm -hmm. um, I, in general, I mean, there are, um, we've had a couple projects where the pushback was enough that we've said, you know, for right now, we're gonna go work somewhere else. The hard thing about that, I think, from, um, as far as like, you know, as a, somebody working for a, a public body, is, you know, there's times where the safety needs are high enough, the equity needs are high enough, that I think as staff we have some responsibilities to um, uh, speak for voices that may not be in the room and really raise the legitimate safety issues that aren't there. So that's something that I think you know we are pretty thoughtful about. That said, if we're in a place where the safety um, issues aren't that much, there aren't you know big equity issues that are going on, other kinds of things, you know we can we would move on. You know we'll say well this may not be right at this point and you know we'll move on to another project. Although, having said that, and even the, you know, Scott's comment about we want the Greenway first, the best, you know, we, we don't do that very much. Um, you know, no but, uh, like, you know, say we're going to get through the process and, you know, we have our design and we're, well, we're just going to skip this element. I mean, that's, that's really rare. Yeah. Um, you know, we're trying to protect our project and um, build the best project we can. And so sometimes it becomes more about negotiation. The one that Scott mentioned was literally our very first one we built, um, you know, all of our projects so far, where, you know, and now, you know, we'll look at it and say, you know, this condition is such that, you know, we probably won't succeed here, so is there an alternate place where we can propose it? Um, or, or um, uh, so like on this route here, we built a, a, a barrier here at Houghton and Portsmouth um, that, you know, it took breaking that log jam first on Kilpatrick and Dana to be able to build a community trust so that when we're finally at the conversation about Houghton and Portsmouth, uh, you know, there's enough sort of trust there that we can do that harder project there, which is adding a lot more value than simply building refuge islands from a number of perspectives. That's um, a significant diversion. Yeah. Well, the other one, and that we haven't done that much of is, where we'll, well, we have done some, I think the cross one of the crossings are going that we added later is a good example is what we'll say is people will say, well, after you put the speed bumps in and other kinds of things, you know, you're not gonna have, traffic volume's not gonna go up even though we're flipping all these stop signs. But we'll say, okay, if that's the case, you know, everything that we're doing as uh, where we're spending money is hopefully adding value. Mm -hmm. And if there's not a problem that we need to address, we don't wanna spend the money either. So we'll say, okay, we're gonna be monitoring this really closely. If volume goes up, you know, more than 10% or whatever we decide as a group, then we're gonna come back in quickly and add this feature. Well, you know, kind of puts, I think that makes a lot more sense to people. We don't do that a ton because the implementation issues are sort of hard, but I think on a number of projects where we felt like we really need this, the community support's not there, but the community support is there to say if there's a problem, we'll address it. We've used that as another tool. Let me give you one more example that I'm just going to do a very quick sketch. Um, so we might have a poster that has, you know, at one intersection, uh, you know, um, uh, four pictures, and actually this 
this is this is a, a true story. Um, uh, and then, Sad but true. This one, this one, I think is a. I'm telling it because it's an example of how to be successful. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry. So you know, we had a project where we'd say, okay, you know, we have a busy street, right? And our neighbor Greenway's crossing, and this is four pictures of the same intersection. And we could get across the street by having refuge islands or curb extensions. So the first conversation is let's just talk about crossing the street and how do we want to do that. And then once we resolve that, you know, then we can talk about volume management. We talk about access. We talk about we want something that blocks cars here. And so we could take that island and we could turn it into a traffic barrier. We take these curb extensions and make them bigger so that they're actually, you know, blocking cars from entering. Um, and so we kind of first talk about crossing and then in that case talk about it as a traffic barrier and, and split it out that way. In this particular case, um, the neighbors said, you know, we have a community center here and a school here and a park over there. Driving there, I need to, I need this access point, right? And so, you know, at one point in the conversation I said, okay, here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing we want a refuge island, um, uh, but you know, we'd like to manage volume, but it does doesn't work here. Um, is that so? We shouldn't pursue a barrier. Is that what I'm hearing? Last chance for anybody. And someone in the hand neighborhood said, "Well, what if you did it in an internal intersection instead of at the busy street?" And I said, "Well, I can't make that judgment here. Um, you know, um, but I can take it back and we can review it. And now it's the only one where we're building an internal central and Tyler." Um, but you know, by you know, even within that intersection, providing um, uh, you know options of you know, sometimes we don't have that option. Sometimes the only thing that fits is the refuge island. You know, and actually, we generally prefer refuge islands over the curb extensions. Um, Why is that? Um, well, uh, they cost less. They cost a lot less. They you're only crossing half the street. They're a lot more visible and present. They're um, you know, they're uh, and they cost less, and they cost less. <laughs> um, you know, where they, it rains, because so, so you don't have to extend the drain or mess with the drainage. Right. right. Also, yeah. when you think about it, I think when you think about like applying NCHRP five sixty two, the which is the which you guys should you guys should learn it. Go to the website, okay. look because there's a nice little one page summaries of it. But it's basically that's the standard for how you um, make crossing improvements at unsignalized intersections. Okay. And as Scott can talk about it in more detail, I can butcher up is when you look at the gaps that are available and you have to cross two lanes going different directions or you only have to cross one lane the gaps become there just become a lot more gaps with a pedestrian island than with uh, you know the crossing ends up being easier because of the gaps that you're able to but pedestrians younger and older are not as able to determine when two gaps are going to coincide at the same spot long enough for them to cross the street it's a cognitive issue and so crossing at a curb extension gets you a shorter distance, but it doesn't remove that cognitive barrier. Whereas crossing to the middle of a street, you only have to focus on one direction at a time, yeah. get halfway there, then you can, if there's enough space, keep going. And by state law, you're definitely crossing the street, so a driver has no excuse to think, I didn't know he was crossing the street. But also you can daisy chain a second gap that may not have occurred as you were starting to cross but is there and happens when you get to the middle. So, and they're cheaper. <laughs> Especially they're cheaper if you're also thinking that the way you meet NCHRP 562 is you have to add rapid flash beacons or a hybrid signal. And often you can avoid having to do that by having a, an island. Right. With the curb extensions, you just can't move it. The and my observation is that there's just a lot more mass to them. You know, you have your sign in the middle of the street, Especially when it's a barrier island, it's a really big device, um, and I just think drivers notice it. Do you guys get pushback on every diverter you propose? Is there any no time? maintainer? Yeah, <laughs> I, Mark calls them maintainer. I call them barriers. Um, uh, uh, but, he likes putting um, barriers in people's neighborhoods. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. barriers. Yeah, the more walls, the better. Dream. Um, <laughs> yeah, no dreams. Um, uh, you know, by being strategic, you know, of picking low volume streets, um, by being ready, you know, when we're going to put in a traffic barrier, we're ready to talk about, hey, you know, you can still get to your house this way, 
if you live on this block. Um, you know, sometimes we get uh, concern on an adjacent street. Well, if you block the street here, you know, um, we can point to our data that says, you know, so far with our projects, we um, have the same volume before and after. Um, and we'll, we'll do that here too. We'll, you know, because when we put in a track, when we put in all this other stuff, there's not really that much of a perceived or real threat to adjacent streets. When we put in a traffic barrier, you know, that goes up. And so we'll take more data on those streets and we'll commit, hey, we'll take before and after data, we'll make sure. We'll also do some preemptive things, like install some additional st stop signs on that adjacent street. So we increase a little bit of friction on that street so that it's less attractive to drive on. Um, what about uh, businesses around? Do you generally get pushback from businesses on the street if you put a maintainer on their street? We, well, we, try to, we try to move away from the commercial zoning before we start considering diversion. We have done diversion in a highly dense commercial area, but um, at that location they were asking for us to do that as opposed to at the second location where we changed our diverter into just refuge islands. On that, yeah, so, that first. Uh, and because we're not on the collector itself, it's usually less of an issue. I mean, everything's site specific. Uh, but the businesses, for the most part, are more, more focused on traffic coming on the collectors, automotive vehicle traffic. So it's, you know, often isn't as much of an issue as you might think it is. Do we talk about that general question about routing of greenways and security sure. and commercial areas? Sure. Um, ask the question again. I mean, so the, um, I think I get it. So obviously uh, you want your greenways to be used by as many people as possible right. and I assume Portland is like Seattle in that uh, a lot of your population lives in a relatively small land mass, you right. know, high density housing right. and then a lot of single family neighborhoods. Right. Um, and obviously a greenway, the goal is to be, uh, as you guys say, you're routing it, you're primarily, you're, you, you choose general corridors but then you actually choose your specific streets basically for the low, you know, pretty low traffic right. volumes to your primary streets. Your primary concern is what I'm getting at, mm -hmm. like you choose specifically the lowest volume streets. Yeah. Um, obviously uh, density tends to drive automotive traffic and pedestrians so how do you sort of, how do you provide that access into the dense urban, how do you provide a access into dense urban environments? I don't see neighbor greenways as a downtown strategy. Right, but uh, this is not downtown. Right. I mean, like Seattle has lots of sort of, um, you know, we have, uh, the city actually has a formal, it's called urban villages. You have uh, into the urban centers where, yes, you have the high rises and everything. There are also urban villages, which are the city, you know, like the city puts libraries there, the city right. uh, is trying to put transit there and stuff like that. And a lot of our city infrastructure is kind of built around the idea of sort of building, zoning these areas for growth. Right. Um, and so we have a lot of islands of density, and especially residential density with like sort of low intensity, mixed use sort of new urbanist stuff where like you have like local retail at the ground floor and then low to low rise to mid rise apartments. We have a lot of sort of islands of that in Seattle. How do you, you know, obviously you want to provide as good access to that as possible, but those areas drive more traffic because you have more people that are like, how do you, how do you get that access? I think, I mean, one, anyway? yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, it's really case by case. I mean, I think what you do is you look at, I mean, I was thinking sort of like the Selwood is one example, a part of town where we've done a fair number of neighbor greenways. And you know, you're having that conversation. If you're talking to your neighbor or other people in the, in the business community, what's the best street? Um, and you just, you know, you, you're trying to pick the best street that you can. It's actually someone that we're just learning on. We may have more information to share, I mean, as well as we're, with our um, rollout of our um, uh, bike share program, and with bike share mostly being concentrated in more dense places, it's something that we're, um, I and mean, even though Greg says, you know, neighborhood greenways in general may be not part of your downtown strategy, right. I think at the same time, uh, Greg and Scott and myself are really, we think there are streets that have a lot of the advantages even in your most dense areas. They're lower volume, they make the connectivity, the connectivity's broken up for cars, right. but it's really site specific. And it may be that in those cases, what happens is you get a street that has 1,500 cars a day, but it's like our downtown, the speeds are 12 and a half miles an hour. So if, you can, if there's things that you can do to sort of deal with slightly higher volume, but control speeds a little bit better, I mean, again, breaking up that grid so that you're not getting motor vehicle, you know, increasing motor vehicle volume yeah. um, would probably be the... So this is Southeast Tacoma Street right here. Um, just give you a quick snapshot of it. Um, you know, it's uh, carrying 24,000 cars a day or something. Um, 
you know, it feeds the Selwood Bridge across the Boromir River. It's got um, coffee shops and hipsters. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, the grocery store and library close. and yeah, close. Uh, close and close stuff like that. Which is and our neighbor Greenway is this street right here, Spokane. And we try we try to get our neighborhood greenways a block at most off of those busier commercial streets mm -hmm. because cyclists want to go to the exact same places people are driving to. Right. And, and it, but do you do you do any kind of treatments to actually provide that? Or do you just assume people will ride on the sidewalks? Or what do you? Is there any? Is there any way that you, you bridge that last block? Because you know, well, you know, um, the way that I foresee doing it is that you're not you know trying to get to another spot here. Um, so here's uh, Northeast Alberta Street that's kind of fuzzy right now. Um, but the going neighbor greenway is right here, the hand that's going. This is Alberta, you know, very dense commercial district. Um, Alberta Street is a street that's very constrained. It's, it's not a street that, you know, I foresee us being able to strip all the parking and take out all the curb extensions and then put in four foot bike lanes um you know it's a you know it's a street you know you don't really have room for bike lanes here without doing a lot of stuff that you know would cause other problems like you know so you know alberta happens to have a, a whole series of bike corrals throughout um the corridor and so you know if we have bike corrals that are high capacity bike parking right and those are put in places where you have commercial activity happening along this corridor we have this neighborhood greenway two blocks away right here on going you know um you know if we had like let's say there's a bike crowd here at 22nd in alberta if and 22nd is a really quiet calm peaceful street so if there's a sign on going right here that says you know alberta business district with an arrow you know and then you ride two blocks and then there's a bike crowd right here if you can park at then you're in the middle of your business district and you know, and and your trip is served that way. And it'd just be showers or whatever. To just like some very simple treatment on that access. Yeah, tool. yeah. Or just the arrow, or just the signs that says right. go that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And with, especially with the things like Greg saying, where you have more on-street bike parking or parklets or other kinds of things that are starting to develop, that kind of signage is you're sort of so you're bringing people in rather than having them just go yeah, through. Yeah, I really like the idea of just having less sort of like you have a high density and like plastic bike parking right there and hopefully it would be really close to the right. street but so you would actually because I that kind of really that seems to address my question. Cool. So uh, can I ask another Sure, you um, have a question about hills. Right? Yes, so like you know Seattle obviously famously has hills um, yeah. and obviously some of these are always going to be a bit intractable but we have a lot of you know there's a lot of <laughs> grades throughout Seattle that are somewhat challenging to at least some riders. Have you, do you have any examples of situations where you've uh, maybe created an alternative path on a greenway or made a uh, sort of diverted a greenway to provide an uh, easy way to get up a hill? Or have you ever sort of, have you ever, have you have tried to sort of make hills more tractable to riders in your greenways or have you always been able to choose them to be flat? Uh, I mean, it's yeah, I mean, I, I live in southwest Portland in a pretty hilly section. I live on a neighbor to Greenway in that part of town. And um, it's a challenge, like you're saying. I mean, we try to find the routes that are, uh, have, you know, the best grade that we can get that's off the busy street, but sometimes it's steep. I think when I was in Seattle, I said um, before University of Washington that, um, you know, the idea that there might be some part of your route that you might walk on. Um, and if you think about delay, right, as far as like when you're waiting at a signal, you know, walking up one steep hill might be about the same amount of time as, you know, waiting through a signal. Culturally, I think that's something that, you know, people have to get comfortable with. Yeah. I also feel like in certain parts of town, and this is a, a little bit out there idea, but I think there are places that some people are going to need in the future electric bikes or electric assist to really make, if you know, if you want to, um, you know, this to work. There's going to be places like that where, for some riders, that's probably what they're going to want, oh, yeah. and that's what's going to be have to make it work. Um, and again, it's depending on the type of trip and who you're riding with and how you need to get somewhere. Uh, you know, we we'll make those decisions. We we'll make those uh, trade-offs. Uh, another one final uh, obstacle: Have you guys had to put a greenway through a really uh, difficult grid break? We have a lot of really nasty grid breaks in Seattle. Uh -huh. uh, we have like diagonal streets of like six-way, five-way intersections. Right. I think we have some good design. I mean, we have good designs for like the offset, so the thirty-third right. and going. So you've probably seen those kind I've of. Seen, I think I saw in a uh, presentation. Yeah. So that. I think we have some nice basic. What we do is we basically have one crossing and then bring the. Um, 
on one side of the street the bikes up onto basically a short cycle track. Right. You know, and that's what I think worked really well for us as a way of dealing with that. For the diagonals, um, um, Sandy at uh, Sandy at 56th, we had an existing head signal, right. and we added um, buttons for the cyclists to push to activate the pedestrian signal, but considered a half signal, it's not allowed anymore. Yeah. But we have them already in place, and we're not being required to take them out. What is a half signal? That's where the that's where the side streets have stop signs. And the, but there's a signal for pedestrians to cross the, a busy street, as in this case a four lane with parking on both sides. Okay. So it, it's a signal that only stops the through street, but yeah. the side streets are still controlled by stop signs. So we, we adjust the intersection so that we get cyclists to a crossing point and provide them a button to push. So they activate the pedestrian signal and follow the pedestrian signal head as their guide to okay. cross the street. Okay. So that can work from time to time. We, even, we have paid for signals to get pedestrians across the street to a cycle track, and included in those in these two locations by signals, where um, in one location a standard crossing intersection, but in another location it's a T intersection, and we we uh, did the signal facing so that the peds and bikes become a fourth leg of a T intersection, and so east west gets to go, north um, split phase gets to go, and then south ped and bike only split phase gets to go in their turn. Okay. So um, there's other ways to work around the it. The other one that I hadn't thought about, but there are, I think, good examples of this in Portland, especially in the hillier places of where, um, even on really low volume streets, we basically have a climbing bike lane or a shoulder. Right. Because that, you know, that's, if you, that is really important. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what it will entice people to get onto a slightly higher grade, um, is that they know, okay, I'm basically riding on a trail. Is there, are there any cases, uh, so um, yeah. SDOT generally puts showers downhill, like uh, so it does not sure. have room for bike lanes in both directions, typically right. there'll be the bike lane on the uphill, showers downhill, yeah. um, but occasionally SDOT puts in downhill bike lanes. Uh, yeah. I can predict it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we actually yeah. have to get onto our. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I know sorry. you guys are kind of wrapping up. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. I have one, one sure, quick sure. question, which is what your your annual budget is for. Our annual but our, our annual budget for our neighbor agreements right now is about eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. And what about pet bike general items? Uh, that's really that's hard to answer because um, like we just did in the last couple of years. Um, we dedicated $16 million um, to like additional sidewalks as okay. more kind of discretionary program. We have lots of, um, it would probably be better for us to just send you some more budget information. Sure, and eight, um, 850 for 15 miles. Yeah, but well, yeah, so a little bit of complicated. I mean, the thing that makes it, we have some projects that are, when we count the 15 miles, it includes some like uh, federally funded grant projects. So my, when I say the 850,000, which used to be a million, that was the discretionary ga gas tax, parking fee, utility license revenue. And signals are in there um, too? Yeah, again though, if you think about it, hardly any, because you know, at a $250,000 a signal, which these days is actually you know, a pretty good price for yeah. a signal, um, you, you know, we're not doing very much signalization. And that 850000 is a little bit misleading because there's other grants that are coming in that are paying for some other projects. But just as far as our discretionary revenue, it's about eight fifty. We're also uh, grabbing money from anywhere. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, like stormwater money or, sure. or, you know, um, uh, uh, urban renewal money or, yeah. you know, I'd say the better way to think about it is that, you know, our average cost $140,000 a mile. So, um, you know, when you when you look at that, or you know, then you figure out which money we you know need to find to make our projects work. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, uh, use 140,000 per mile, you know, when we look at an intersection crossing and we're putting curb ramps and you know that itself is half that half that cost. And we look at drainage and everything else. I mean, how do you take a challenging greenway that's going to cost three or four times that and stretch it for the entire you know, what your deliverable budget is? forego that and look for the easy oh I mean sometimes we have to I mean that's a part of why I mean like one of the things I think we do less of than we used to is like if we know like that picture of the Greg here where there's curb extensions and islands and other yeah, kinds of things yeah, where we used to come out and have a lot more of those options mm -hmm. you know and we don't put if we don't have funding for an option and we don't think it's that great of an option we're like why bring it out and talk to people 
-hmm. So, you know, everybody, would, I mean, a lot of people would like a green, pretty curb extension. If we don't think it adds value and it's, that's what's sort of pushing us out of budget, we probably won't even bring it out. If people talk to us about it, then we'll say, well, here's why we aren't including it. We'll be really upfront about it. Uh, but we're, it's, um, you know, to be honest with you, the only way we can hit that $140,000 per mile is to be really thoughtful in picking out streets that, um, that we know that are going to be really efficient that way. And I think that is, I mean, what's great about the work you guys are doing that we don't have um, is that level of activism in the neighborhoods and sort of pushing the greenways. The hard part about that is I imagine it's a little bit harder in the sense that you'll get people who come back who have done the grassroots work and say, here's the line we want, and it costs a million and a half dollars mm -hmm. or something like that. Because we're kind of managing both those things together, um, I think we're able to roll forward um, projects and start the community involvement on stuff that we already know kind of uh, meets that sweet spot as far as return on investment and cost, or just return on investment. Um, did you add anything to that? We also can, we also on occasion will we'll break a larger project into, into phases. Mm -hmm. uh, well, next year we'll start the 130s and it's how many miles? Four miles? Four or five. Four or five miles of project and we've already broken it into three pieces. And we'll start our outreach on all three pieces in one year, but we are we won't promise to build or complete everything for at least three or four years because it's going to take this one has like three, four cycle tracks that we have to build in order to get across some major streets in East County. So. Cool. Thanks everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I did that.